you to know that I know that I need you, God. You know I need you, but I want you to know that I'm aware of the fact, God, that I know that I need you. Right now, God, in a brand new year, Lord, I need your help. I need your grace. I need your mercy, God. I need you guiding me and ordering my steps, Lord. Hallelujah. What a privilege we have to come before him tonight. Amen. We're going to go to prayer for Sister Dorothy for a healing. Sister Fazel for healing. Sister Janie's brother needs healing and salvation, have an open heart surgery. Sister Kanoi needs healing. Amen. We got a prayer cloth here. Praying for Benjamin Braun for salvation. Special need. Prayer for joy and contentment in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Other requests that you'd show by lifting your hands. All over this house, God is mindful. Let's pray right now. God, we need you. We need your touch, Lord. We need your help, God. We're a needy people, Lord. We're asking you, the God that can, the only God that can hear and answer our prayers. Lord, would you meet these needs, God? Would you work the works of healing, God, for these our brothers, our sisters? those that are in need tonight, God, would you help them, Lord? Fill this one with the joy of the Holy Ghost, God. Draw these souls that are lost, God, without you and let them know your touch, your great love and power and salvation. Work your mighty work, God. We give you thanks, Lord. We give you praise. Thank you for giving us access to you, God, being our God, making a way, Lord, out of no way. Amen. Go ahead and give him a hand clap of thanksgiving. Hallelujah, we love you, Jesus. Praise you, mighty God. So good to have Brother Baker with us tonight. Amen. Looking forward to it. Been looking forward to it for over a week now. Good to have Sister Madison here. Been with us all weekend long. Good to have Brother Matt Holland with us tonight. Any other guests that are here we're glad you're in church tonight. Good to see you in the house of the Lord on a brand new year. Thank God for this day. Hallelujah. Thank God that we're in his house. First day of a brand new year. Man, I don't know hardly any people that don't like something brand new. Something that feels new, looks new, smells new, is new. Brand new car and you get behind the wheel, it just feels good. To have that brand new, puts a brand new outfit on, just feels good. Hey Amen. Get a new deer rifle, feels good. Hey Amen. Thank God for a brand new year that he's given us. Hey Amen. Last year might not have been the year we wanted it to be. But we can put that one in the past and say, thank you, Lord, for a brand new one. Thank you, God, that we don't have to live in the past. If it didn't go the way I wanted it to, God, I'm looking for 2023 to be my year, to be the year of blessing, to be the year where you just open doors, God, to be the year where lost loved ones come in, God. I've got great expectation for this year, God, that you have given us tonight. Amen. God knows that we need something new. Amen. That's why we got changing of the seasons, new moons. New things that God talks about in his word. The Bible said in Revelation 21 and 5, And he that sat up on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. I'm going to make new things. All things new. Do you reckon he meant everything new? God one day is going to wipe what we know clean. He's going to wipe the slate clean. And he's going to make you all things new. Amen. Jeremiah 31 and 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. I've got a covenant that I made with Abraham. Amen. But I'm going to give you all a new covenant. I've got something that I want to give you that's going to be brand new. It's going to be a better covenant. It's going to be a better way. Amen. Hebrews 8 and 13. In that he saith a new covenant, 
He made the first old. The first wasn't good enough because that first covenant was from the blood of bulls and goats. But he had a new and a living way that he wanted to consecrate for us through the veil, that is, through his flesh. Amen. Amen. A brand new covenant. Ezekiel 36 and 26. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. God said, I'm going to give you a brand new heart. I'm going to give you a brand new spirit. Are you thankful for this Holy Ghost salvation and experience that we're here enjoying tonight? Amen. Mark 14 and 24, and he said unto them, this is the blood, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. This is that new covenant that I'm bringing in. It's going to be in my blood. I'm going to seal it with my blood. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Are you thankful that God made you a brand new creature? God, I'm thankful you didn't leave me like I was when you found me. I'm glad you didn't leave me in my sin. I'm glad you didn't leave my mind the way that it was, God. But you washed me and you cleansed me and made me a new creature. Lamentations 3 and 22. It is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. God's mercy was new to us when we open our eyes today. God's mercies will be new to us if we open them tomorrow. God's mercies are new every day. His compassions are real every day for his people. Amen. Revelation 21 and 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. God's got some brand new things in store for his church. God's got a brand new heaven and a brand new earth. And he said it's just like a bride that's adorned herself and made herself beautiful for her husband. Wants to give us the best that he's got. God wants to bless his church with the best that he's got. Woo! 2 Peter 3 and 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise... That promise that he promised us of a new heaven and a new earth. Look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. There won't be any sin that enters into that new heaven. There won't be any of this junk that we're having to put up with down here on this earth when we make it into that new heaven. Aren't you thankful God's got a place prepared? For them that are preparing themselves for him. Woo! And all this God wants to give us new. All these new things God wants to give us. Amen. He's given us a brand new chance tonight. In a brand new year tonight. To reach out to him. To dedicate to him. To devote to him. Amen. But God's not going to do it all for us. God's going to say, you're going to have to want it. You're going to have to press for it. Titus 3 and 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. God, I want it renewed tonight. God, don't ever let this experience grow old. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just like that car can grow old after about five or ten years, this Holy Ghost could grow old if we let it grow old. All the new things God wants to give us, his new mercies, can grow old if we let them grow old. 
But I, for one, choose to say, God, I'm not going to let it grow old. I'm going to stir up something on the inside of me, this gift that you've given me, God, this new life that you've given me to walk in, Lord. I want to be renewed tonight. How about you? Amen. Clap your hands and worship the Lord. Woo. Thank you for making all things new, Sister Mandy's coming. Hallelujah. Let's worship our God tonight. I was once in bondage, lost in sin. Along came Jesus and he took me in. I don't know what it means to you. He's all right with me. I was once in bondage, lost in sin. Along came Jesus and he took me in. He's all right. 
Thank you for your giving. You can be seated tonight. Man, it is good to be in church tonight. Amen. Good to have my little daughter here. Man, you don't know. I don't know. Maybe you do know what it's like. Your child goes off and she comes back and he comes back. It's a good feeling. But this is the last night. Hmm. Be headed back north in the morning. We want her to testify tonight, though. Brother Carson, come here and help me. We want her to kick off testimony service tonight. I love the Lord tonight and happy to be home, happy to see everybody, and just looking forward to what 2023 has in store, and I just want to be a part of End Time Revival. I just want to say that I love the Lord and I thank him for another safe travels that we've had over the past few days. And I was reflecting back on 2022 and God's goodness. He's been good to me. I have no complaints. It doesn't matter what the situation is. God is good. And I'm thankful for 2023. I was thinking about it while the preacher was preaching last night, Brother Paul, and he was preaching about just stand. And no matter what comes your way, if you will just stand, it, don't, it didn't say you wouldn't trip. It didn't say you wouldn't get pushed over a little or whatever. He said, but no matter what it comes your way, you just stand. And I just want to continue to do that in the Holy Ghost. And I just thank God for his goodness. He has been so, so very good to me. I was thinking about 2023 and I was like, what scripture can I just hold to this year and all that? And then I was thinking about how Brother Jones always says, the devil is a liar. Come back to my mind, a man back in Kentucky used to always get up and say, the devil is a bow-legged liar and he don't even have the keys to his own house. And I'm just thankful to know who holds the keys to the kingdom. And I serve that God. People change and things change, but I serve a God who will never change. Well, I thank God for the Holy Ghost. Thank you for his keeping power. And last week, I've told several people that I was hunting, and I got ready to come down off the ladder, and I slipped and fell. And it was only about 10 feet, but felt forever. And when I fell, I had a lot of padding clothes on. That kept me, and there was snow on the ground, and... But my head hit my rifle. I had done lowered and it was laying on the ground. And uh, I sat up and my first thought was, I'm okay. And then I stood up and, you know, it, I actually felt okay. I felt pretty calm. And then after a while, it just, you know, my brother came and I started crying. And then I was thinking, you know, so many things. Bad things could have happened, broken bones, the gun could have went off. And, you know, several times I broke down and cried that day and just made me realize the keeping power of God. And I'm just, I'm just so thankful for God. I'm thankful. It made me realize just how real God was and his mercy to me. And I appreciate and love him. Amen. Thank God. He's keeping hand of protection for every testimony. Let's stand tonight. Man, we miss our pastor. I'm going into a new year without him here. Wish he was here, but I know he's there doing the good work for the Lord. But we are blessed to have Brother Baker with us tonight. Man, like I've said already, we've been excited about him being here. Since we knew he was coming a little over a week ago. Brother Baker, you preach to us tonight. You're going to help him preach? Welcome him right now. Jesus. Praise the Lord. Clap your hands to Jesus. 
Amen. Amen. Aren't you thankful that this is what you're doing on the first night of 2023? Boy, it's going to take a while to get used to saying that, isn't it? Uh, but before you know it, we'll be trying to say 2024, or it seems that way. So we don't have a whole lot of time to do what we need to be doing. We might as well start tonight. Yes, sir. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I don't know if I'm going to sing or not. Uh, I had a couple of songs I thought I might sing, and then I got to thinking about it, and, you know, I just decided we might wait and sing those next week, but I don't know, because uh, we will be back next week, and my wife will be here next week. She is in Colorado visiting uh, Josh and, and, and Irene and, and the kids there, and in fact, I was there last week, and I drove home Monday, and I'm here tonight and uh, we are so excited to be here and and occasionally have received a uh, group text from brother couch and in the philippines and some some pictures and different things that are going on there and i'll tell you uh if 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 if, if there's anything happening uh, it looks like it's happening in the philippines a lot of good things happening there and great church and just excited with them amen i said we're excited with them because of what god is doing and it is an honor to be here tonight and and i always love coming home and uh just great church great folks serving and loving and worshiping a great god amen and so i think i am just gonna preach but if y'all want to hang around up there I don't know how long I'm going to be, but I'll preach till I'm through or until y'all are through. And then, and then so I, I'm not saying I'm going to be 10 minutes. Uh, I'm just saying that it's going to be either way, one or the other. Is that clear enough? Does that make perfect, perfect sense to you folks? Hey, man, give me a little room. Just give me a little room. Woo! Amen. Well, this is a new year, and, and Brother Andrew gave us a lot of good things tonight. Brother Andrews, with an S, right? <laughs> a lot of good things tonight because God has something new every day. Uh, I preached this morning for Brother, Brother uh, Barnhill and... Really, I don't know if I even called it preaching, but this morning when I got up and started praying and just preparing for the day, there was, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit, I'm not going to preach it tonight, and I probably won't preach it uh, uh, in the next few services, whatever, but I, I, from that, that quote, today is the first day of the rest of your life. And I'll tell you, all we have is today. That's all we got. We can talk about 2023, but you know what all we got is January 1, 2023. And anything we're going to do for God, we've just got today to do it. And while it is, the Bible said, while it is today, we got to work. Amen. And so we could start this year off just like we did last year and say, boy, this is the first day of 2022. We're going to do something for God this year. No, we're not. We're going to do something for God today. 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 Amen. We're not going to procrastinate and do what we always do on what, with our New Year's resolutions, whether it's losing weight, being a better person, having revival or whatever, whatever it is, whatever it is, because we don't have 365 days to do it in. We got one day. Today is the day of salvation. We've got to live every day like it is today because we're not promised tomorrow. Amen. And there's another quote that is, Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift. That's why they call it 
the present. And we have to live in the moment. We can't say tomorrow I will do this or tomorrow I will go here. Amen. But Jesus said, take no thought for tomorrow. I mean, we can't live in tomorrow or next week. We've got to do it today. And I'll tell you, we might as well start doing it right now. Yeah. Amen. If you're going to be a better worshiper, this is your chance to do it. If you're going to be a better prayer warrior, this is your chance to do it. If you want to be more devoted and dedicated to living for God, this is the moment. Amen. If we're not careful, we'll just sit right there and say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Woo. Just like we did last year. Hello. And probably some of us said it the year before, but while it is today. Amen. Well, that's the end of that little sermonette. Praise God. But I want you to turn with me in the book of 2 Kings, chapter number 13. And again, let me say it is an honor to be here. We give honor to Pastor Couch, Sister Couch, and their family, and all of you, the ministry of this church, and the, and the helpers and the workers, and even the old sorehead or two that might be a part of this church. If there are any soreheads, I don't know. Years ago, we went through a little town in Arkansas, and they had a sign that said the population was about 23 and a few old soreheads. So I don't know if there are any old sore heads in here tonight, but anyway, we're so glad to be here. Amen, amen. In the book of 2 Kings, chapter number 13, I want to begin reading with verse number 14. Now, Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness, wherewith he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him, and wept over his face and said, O oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And Elisha said unto him, Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, Put thy hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hand upon the king's hand. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, The era of the Lord's deliverance and the era of deliverance from Syria. For thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek till thou hast consumed them. And he said, Take the arrows. And he took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, Smite upon the ground. And he smote three times or thrice and stayed or stopped. And the man of God was wroth with him and said, Thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. Then hadst thou smitten Syria till thou had consumed it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. Brother Andrews, would you pray? Lord of heaven, we love you tonight. Thank you for your wonderful presence. God, that you would talk to our hearts even tonight in this world. You would meet with us and minister to this assembly. A divine visitation of your great presence in this house. Let everybody say amen. God bless you. You may be seated. How, how many of you have ever heard remember Brother R.A. Hancock whenever he would read from, his, from the scripture whenever he was preaching a lot of times he would read like uh, you know someone who's uh, doing like the Bible dramatized version of the Bible where they have different voices for the different characters. Anybody remember Brother, Brother R.A. Hancock reading like that? Yes. Y'all remember that? I was always fascinated with that, that, that he had that ability in that moment, you know, while he was reading. And I don't know if he practiced it before or whatever, but anyway, it, it, I, I liked, I was fascinated with that as a young minister, just a young person, fascinated that nobody, you know, I, I, there was no other minister that I knew that did that. And I've always wanted to do that. So...
I've always been afraid to do that because I'm afraid people laugh. Just like nobody laughed when Brother R.A. Hancock did that. Everybody was like, wow. It was a wow moment when he would, you know, it would, and honestly, really, it, it kind of made it more alive to me. You know, it's like, you, you've got the Bible on cassette. No, nobody has cassettes. We don't even have cassettes. You can't even buy an automobile anymore with a CD player in it. Uh, so I'm, I'm a dinosaur, I guess. But you used to have the cassette, you know, Bible on cassette. And we had one that was that guy, whatever his name, I don't know who he was, but anyway, he was boring to listen to. Monotone, you know. And then we had the dramatized edition that had the background noise and, you know, whenever Jesus was talking and whenever the, the woman at the well or, or, you know, whoever it was and the difference. And, and, you know, I could just sit there and look at, I mean, listen to that all day long. <laughs> But r really, literally, it did come alive. Yes. It really made a difference. And so that's the way. And I, when I read, there's, this is one of the very, one of the very, I want to say few, but maybe not few is the right, but the most dramatized versions of just the King James Bible when it talks about this story. I mean, really, it, it, it goes into... It talks about, well, let me just read some of it again. Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness wherever he died, and Joash, the king of Israel, came down, wept over his face, and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Now, you know that's exactly what Elijah, Elisha said to Elijah whenever the chariot was coming down at the river Jordan and going to pick him up. It's almost like it was a, a pointed or a... a a real, I don't know what's the right word, a, uh, a blast from the past that I wonder what went through Je uh, Elisha's mind when he said that. Did, was it a flashback? Was it something that, that, that took him back X amount of years to a point when there was this great transition in his life from just the servant of Elijah, whenever Elijah said, what, what, what would you like to have when, you, when I leave? And he said, I want a double portion of your spirit. Well, the only way you're going to, that's a hard thing, but I'm going to tell you, the only way you're going to get that is if you're there when I'm gone and <laughs> it happened that way. And then, and then it goes on to say, Elisha said to him, take bow and arrow. And he, and he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said, he said, Elisha is doing the talking. And so right there, you know, that's the narrator, the narrative, the, the, you know, when he would be in a different voice. Because uh, there's three different voices here. Or two different voices. Yeah, three different voices. And then the, 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 narr the narrator, he kicks in and with his tone, he says, and he said unto the king, and then this is what he said unto the king. This, now this is Elisha talking. Put thy hand upon the bow. Well, that'd be, that'd be tough to do, wouldn't it? To follow through with that. But I would, <laughs> I wish I could do that. Because it would put us right there. Am I making any sense? I, I don't even know why I'm saying all this, because this is not even what I'm going to preach about tonight. <laughs> but I just thought about that. And he put his hand upon it, and Elisha put his hand upon the king. It goes into every detail of that event, every part of it, a picture of what is happening here. But really, what I want to talk to us tonight about is in verse number... 18, he turned it, he said, take the arrows, and he took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, smite upon the ground. And he smote the ground three times and stopped. And the man of God was wroth with him and said, thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. Then hadst thou smitten Syria until thou had consumed it. Whereas 
Now thou shalt smite Syria but three times. Now, I'll tell you, for years I have talked about that, you know, smiting the ground and, and use the illustration that he took the arrows that remained and he just started smiting the ground. You know, have, have you ever, maybe you've heard me say that. Maybe you heard somebody else, maybe you said that. That that's actually what you thought he was doing. That he was taking the arrows that remained and he just started beating the ground with them. Now that makes sense if it was anything but an arrow. But that's not what you do with an arrow, is it? When you go bow hunting, do you take your arrows and just beat the ground until the deer, the deer falls over dead? You're not going to bring no venison home if that's the way you go bow hunting. The way you go bow hunting is just exactly what Elisha told him to do in the beginning was you put the arrow in the bow and you open the window eastward and you shoot the arrow. And when you shoot the arrow, Elisha said, this is the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. From Syria. You're shooting this arrow for a purpose. There's something that you're intending to do when you shoot this arrow. This is the arrow of the Lord's deliverance from Syria. For you're going to smite Syria until you have consumed them. And how are you going to do it? By shooting the arrow. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, when he told him to take the arrows that remain and smite the ground, he did not take them out of the quiver and beat them on the ground. He took those arrows that remained and one by one he notched them and he shot them out the window. And the term... Smiting the ground is what they use to define the era has hit its mark. In fact, if you were to do a little Bible study or even not even a Bible study, a little history study, if you saw some pictures depicting warfare in Bible days or in combat, even as late as the Civil War, the men that were fighting those battles, whatever piece of equipment, whether it was a rifle, uh, the gun, spear, sword, bow, arrow, they all lined up shoulder to shoulder, rank to rank, until they were hundreds or thousands deep and wide. And their adversary was out there somewhere in the distance. Sometimes they couldn't even see them yet, but they knew where they were. And on the command, they would release an arrow and shoot in the direction of their adversary. Remember the story in the Bible where Saul went out to battle and the prophet told him, don't go, and he went. And there was a guy that didn't even know where his arrow was going didn't shoot it in any particular direction, but God directed the arrow and shot Saul. And it was his demise because somebody just was smiting the ground and fighting. Maybe a battle that you're not even aware of. You don't even see your adversary, but they just understood that was warfare. That's the way they fought their battles. And they fought their battles and kept smiting the ground until every era they had was released. And then they took up their sword <laughs> because the whole time they were marching toward their adversary. And at some point in battle, they could see them until finally it was the white of their eyes. That's how they fought their battles. 
They didn't play games. They didn't smite the ground. Nothing like it. It wasn't like that at all. Warfare in those days was a lot different than it is now. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story. I preached a message one time. The title of this, I don't know where, I don't think I ever preached it here, but there's been a few times I preached this message. The title of it was, The Engines Are Coming. And did you know there are engines in the Bible? Did, did, is there any Bible scholars here tonight that know that there are engines in the Bible? There's a few back here that are aware that there are, here's that aware that there are engines in the Bible. In fact, I want, you to, I want you to know that there are engines in the Bible. I don't know if there's any cowboys in the Bible, but I know there are engines in the Bible. And I'll show them to you here in just a second. If you got your Bible, I want you to turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter number 26. Second Chronicles. Chapter number 26. In my Bible, that's on page 399. I don't know where it's at on yours, but in my Bible, it's on it's page 399. And I'm swiftly turning to 399. And here it is right here. Second Chronicles chapter number 26, verse... I'm going to back up a little bit and read a little bit. So this is about Uzziah. He's the king of Judah. And God had mightily blessed him, and they, were, they were, had conquered a lot of territory, um, pushed back the Philippines, the Phili not the Philippines, but the Phili Philistines. <laughs> I got Brother Couch on my mind tonight. And so in verse number 9, Moreover, U Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem, in the corner gate, in the valley gate, in the turning of the wall and fortified them. He built towers in the desert, dig many wells where he had much cattle, both in the low country and in the plains, and husbandmen also, and vineyards dressed in the mountains and, and in Carmel, for he loved husbandry. And, and so it talks about these things. In, it, in verse number 12, the whole number of the chief of the fathers of the mighty men of valor were two thousand and six hundred and under their hand was an army three hundred thousand men seven hundred three hundred thousand three hundred thousand seven thousand and five hundred that made war with mighty power to help the king against the enemy and Uzziah prepared for them throughout all the host of shields spears helmets and habergons bows, slings to cast stones. And in verse number 15, the Bible said, and he made in Jerusalem engines. I told you there were engines in the Bible. Y'all reading that right there? Do you see that? Engines. Do y'all see that? You got your Bible out? I'm not, you don't have your Bible out? You be, don't never trust don't never trust what the preacher says. Always have your Bible out. I'm joking about that. You know I'm joking about that. Did, am I not telling the truth? Does it not say right there that they had engines in Jerusalem? Long time before we got them over here. They were in Jerusalem. Different kind of engine. <laughs> That's not politically correct, and I apologize for that. He made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones withal. And his name spread far abroad, and he was marvelously helped till he was strong. It's not only there, but... References are made in, in several places in the book of Ezekiel where they talked about the mounts and the mounts were places where they put these engines of war. In fact, in one place it said, the engines, the mounts are coming. So when I was young and foolish, I preached a message, the engines are coming. Well, does it not say that he's the chief cornerstone? Yeah. The chief shepherd? Hello? Go ahead. Makes perfect sense to me. 
I mean, if we can smite the ground with arrows and kill deer, <laughs> why can't he be the chief cornerstone? <laughs> so I preached, I preached at a youth camp. Now, this has nothing to do, I'm just telling you this story. I preached at a youth camp in Albion, Indiana. Y'all know Brother Archer? He's, I think he's preached here a while back. Brother Archer. No, maybe he preached for Brother Barnhill recently. Brother Archer, his father was the presiding bishop over that youth camp. And I preached. It was a rotating deal. I preached. My family, my, my wife and our children were there. And Brother Ken Bo from Tacoma, Washington. I preached the day service. He preached the night. The next night he preached the day service. I preached the night. We did that. We rotated like three or four days. Of, and, and so... On a Friday night, I preach the, um, I'm sorry, on a Thursday night, I preach the engines are coming. And, you know, we talked about, you know, we, he, God, is, he's never lost a battle. You know, he's, he doesn't know defeat. We're in warfare. We're, this is a battlefield, brother. Now, you know, you know all of that stuff that you do when you try to put together a message? Man, I worked that over. And I had everybody that was, you know, if you had, if you had, any, any Indian blood in you? I want to see your hand. Or is she, are you proud of your heritage? You got a little Indian in you? Raise your hand. As soon as I raised the hand, I'd snatch them, bring them up, put those. I had all them kids on the front row. I had about 75 or 100 kids on the front row. And I said, now I'm going to be preaching something a little bit different tonight. And while I'm preaching, you're going to hear me say this a whole bunch. I'm going to say the engines are coming. And every time I say the engines are coming, I want you kids on the front row to jump up and go, Whoa! Man, you talk about having a time. <laughs> Them kids is jumping up. They were standing in the chairs. The boys took their ties off and tied it around their head. Rock this right here. And they got to going, Yay! And then a boy got on the drums and went, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> There's four or five got the Holy Ghost that night. Three or four got called to the ministry. Four or five accepted, you know, Went to, con, con, you know, to uh, foreign missions. We had a Holy Ghost move. Lord have mercy, you wouldn't believe. It was better than the night the squirrel went berserk in the first self-righteous church in the sleepy little town of Pascagoula. Woo! <laughs> the next night, and I, I don't know if you know Brother Ken Bow, and if he, I don't, you know, he would not appreciate me saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway, because he's probably never going to hear this. The next night, before it was over with, he's a very digni dignified man, very proper, dignified man. The next night, by the time we, we got through having church, I don't remember if he even preached that night, but by the time church is over, every man in the house and took his tie off, including me and Brother Kimbo. And we had it around like this right here. And we were sweating it out for Jesus to the oldies. I'm telling you. Kids were out running around on the outside, falling down, and just having good church, you know. And there was two guys. I remember two guys that came up in a van to get the, B, the B3 organ or whatever it was. And they, they had rented that from a music place. And they were sitting out there in their van watching them people go by like this right here. <laughs> and it was about midnight. And they're still sitting out there watching them young people running around the building, falling down or rolling in the floor. Good times. There ain't nothing wrong with having church like that. Amen. Yeah, man. We can get a little too proper and think that, you know, you know, I don't want to mess my hair up. Or this is a new suit and I still got the tag, you know. I'm going to take it back after a couple of days. <laughs> Some of you ladies have done that. Don't you act so pious. You, you've turned that thing down, you know, put that, that prize tag on the inside, you tucked it away somewhere, and after the special service was over, you took it back and got your money out of, uh, back. I know you've done that. Am I right? Go ahead. 
tell the truth. If you want to be saved, you've got to tell the truth. You know you took it back and said, I, I just don't like it. <laughs> or it didn't fit right. Hello? God, help us tonight. So, I'm so far, I don't remember now what I'm even preaching about. So I want to preach for a few minutes. I, I, I told you I'm not going to be very long. I've been a long time getting here, but I'm almost there now. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about shooting arrows in the dark. Shooting arrows in the dark. So he shot the arrows out the window. And, and he did not have a distinct or directive as far as where except that Elisha said this is the era of the Lord's deliverance from Syria. Yes, sir. You know, and I can, I, can I say this, that in my estimation at that particular time, Syria was like the devil. I mean, everywhere they, it was always some faction that they were fighting that whose roots went back to, who his identification was. You know, and most all of us, we can identify our adversary. You know, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil. Man, the first thing we got to do is identify with our adversary. Amen. And then understand how he works. Because how are we going to defeat an adversary if we don't understand how he works? And so the Bible said we are not ignorant of his vices. We, we know how he works. Amen. It's the same old, same old. Oh, they dress it up a little bit different. And they, they give it a new name, but it's always the same old thing. And, uh, and so he was shooting an arrow. And the man of God told him, this is the arrow. You shoot this arrow. He put his hand on the bow. Hey, man. And he, and, he, and he strung the arrow into the bow. And then the Bible said, Elisha, and he's about to die. The, the old man of God, he's, he's expiring right now. Hey, Amen. In so much that even Joash said, the chariot. I don't know how far gone he was, but in my mind, that makes me think that when Joash walked into the room, into the chamber where Elisha the prophet was, he was on his deathbed. And, and what, what do they call the death rattle and, and all of that? Maybe that's what's going on. But as soon as, 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 as he comes into the room, the man of God realizes uh, this is a very important, uh, important time and, and we've got to cover some things and I don't have much time to cover it. So he's rushing him. Take the bow. Uh, put your hand on the bow. Take the arrow. Hey, Amen. Put your hand on the arrow. Open the window eastward. Uh, and the old man of God rises up uh, and he puts his hand uh, on the hand of the king and he said now shoot yeah. and the bible said he shot and the man of God said that's the arrow I can see him at that moment as he's gazing out the window into a distant battle that they're going to fight they weren't necessarily in the heat of the battle right then but the man of God had an understanding I mean he had a prophetic vision that this moment could change the course of a nation this moment this service this prayer meeting this worship service could make the difference in your life, not just for today, but tomorrow, next week, next month, in the years to come. That are battles that you can win tonight. All you got to do is shoot the arrow. Yeah. Woo hey. I'm talking about uh, putting everything, uh, amen, at our disposal to use, uh, not wasting one moment, not wasting one minute, uh, not wasting one prayer meeting, yeah. one worship service, <laughs> understanding that there's going to be battles I'm going to fight next week, and if I don't have, if I don't get something tonight, I'm going to be sorely equipped 
to face the adversary. Amen. I don't know how to say this, but except just to say it. You know, Ezekiel talks about it. You know, the man on the wall, how he's watching and he sees things. Can I tell you, there's, a, there's, a, there's an elevated place that God has appointed for the man of God that he can see things that the average person can't see. And Joash, though he was the king, he couldn't see the importance of that moment. He couldn't realize that there's a war that's raging against us. That in the next few days and weeks and months, it's going to be detrimental that I prepare for it today. And the way that I prepare for it is I shoot the arrow. We could define, we could put a name on that arrow. In my little research and study, different, you know, different writers say, well, this is the name we're going to give this era. This is the name we're going to give this era. But you see, I don't know what battles you're fighting. And I, don't, I can't even define for each one of you individually what it is that you need to do to name the era that is going to defeat the adversary that's out there somewhere in the distant future that you're not even aware of, the demise that is waiting. You're not aware that somewhere... In the secret corners of the halls of hell, the imps are gathered around a blazing, fiery table, and they're talking about what I can do to bring this one down. I'm reminded of the story in the Bible when the Bible said the sons of God came to present themselves to the Lord, and the devil came also with them. In the book of Job, you know the story. You know the story. Amen. I don't have to rehearse it all the way through except to just remind you that the devil had already been making his plans already trying to devise the downfall of Job. And he said, I can't touch him. You got a hedge around him. But if you just take down the hedge, amen, I can destroy him. But do you realize the Bible let us know that even before that day, Job was aware that there's a devil in hell that's as big as life. And he's trying to take my sons and my daughters. And I've got to build an altar. And I've got to worship at that altar. So the devil doesn't get them. So the Bible said he did it every day. Every day. He said, because he understood. Can I tell you, there's only one thing between your children that are not in church and hell, and that is your prayers and your faithfulness and your devotion and your dedication. Every day, you need to release an arrow out the window, amen, toward the throne of God that says, keep my lost son or daughter, amen, out of the grips, out of the vice, out of the tormenting pit called hell. When I come to church and I worship around an altar, amen, it's not just before God, but I worship in God, amen, to let him know this is my faith in prayer and in praise and in worship to God because there's a battle and I'm going to shout for the battle. I'm not going to wait until I see the adversary in the wide of the eyes, but I'm going to understand he's out there lurking. He's walking up and down and to and fro in the earth and I've got to prepare for the day when I see the adversary knocking at my door I'm going to shoot an arrow I'm going to pray without ceasing I'm going to be steadfast and continual Amen. I'm going to have a sword in my hand and the high praises of God in my mouth continually because this is a daily battle Somebody in this place tonight, amen, needs to shoot an arrow into the darkness and trust God that he's going to direct it. Shout out. Would you just trust God to do it? To release your faith in God tonight that he knows even before I ask before I know even what the storm is he's already gave it a name 
Do you believe that tonight? That God can direct an arrow? That God can give you a word? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Holy Ghost trying to talk to somebody tonight. Somebody needs to realize and recognize Amen. This is my opportunity. Amen. To slay the dragon that's been tormenting. Amen. This is my night. Amen. It may not happen tonight, but I'll tell you what will happen. If you'll just shoot the arrow, and as it goes out the window in faith, you just shout, this is the arrow of the Lord's deliverance for my son or my daughter, for my spouse, Amen. for my family, for my church, whatever it is, the devil's in hell. Tremble when you identify and you proclaim victory and deliverance in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, somebody needs to shoot an arrow. Somebody needs to put your hand on the bow and notch the arrow. Amen. And open the window of faith toward God and speak the word of faith and claim your victory. <laughs> and you shoot every arrow that God gives you tonight. Amen. And tomorrow morning when you wake up, you wake up with a new, fresh anointing, with a new, amen, passion, with a new determination, with another era. Devil, amen. It's not church night, but it's Monday. Amen. And I'm going to prepare. I'm going to make ready for war. Hey, I've got faith that the era of the Lord will find its mark, but I've got to shoot the era. I've got to shoot the arrow. Amen. And the Bible said that the man of God was wroth. Can I say this? You may be seated. That's not what I was asking you if I could say. I want to say that anyway. <laughs> but let me, let me say this. A lot of times we think the preacher's mad. We think, you know, well, he got up on the wrong side of the bed. Have you ever thought about that? Maybe he's the voice, the mouthpiece for God, and God's the one that's a little upset. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and the man of God, he was dying. He was dying. The death angel was right there. <laughs> but he was still the man of God. And he still had a passion for what God had called him to do. And with that weak, trembling hand, something rose up in him and he grasped the hand like a vice grip and said, shoot. And he shot. And then he said, this is the arrow. This is the arrow. Amen. This is it. Can I tell you, you don't never really know which prayer meeting it's going to be. <laughs> Daniel was in prison. He was incarcerated. <laughs> but God delivered him. But you know why God delivered him? Because Daniel never stopped shooting the arrow. Every day, three times a day. Whenever he knew that Darius the king had spies that were watching every move he made. Well, actually, it wasn't Darius that had appointed him. It was the governors of the city who were trying to undermine Daniel because they were jealous of him, his position. And so the Bible said that every day, three times a day, he opened that window toward Jerusalem. And he shot an arrow every morning. And he'd come back at noon. And he'd come back that afternoon. He pulled out another arrow out of the quiver. And he released it again. And all the while, he's praying. Now, I will tell you, literally, he wasn't shooting arrows out the window. Frederically speaking and spiritually speaking, amen, 
He had a prayer that was directed to God for a specific purpose, for a specific reason. And God heard every prayer he prayed. Can I say this? If you're not concerned about it, why would you expect God to be concerned about it? If you're not interested enough to pray about it yourself, why would you think God would give any attention to that situation? But Daniel saw the need to shoot an arrow. Oh, he could have said, well, I prayed this morning and nothing happened, so I guess maybe it's just not God's will. And I'll just accept the fate. But no, he prayed anyway. And when the angel came, the angel said, I heard you the first time you prayed. But I promise you, that's not the only time he heard him pray. Amen. God hears every time you pray. God hears. I'm, I'm not a bow hunter, but I, I've, I've shot it a little bit. I've never killed anything with it. Uh, never hit the mark with it. <laughs> but I do know when you notch that and you release it, there's a shh, just the slightest hint of a shh. And I will tell you that God's ear is a tent to the prayer. And when you pray that prayer, even the slightest hint. Psh, amen. There may be a room full of people making all kinds of noise. There may be a turmoil going on. You may be right in the heat of the battle in the throes of the adversary. But if you'll just call on the name of Jesus, yeah. above all the rumble, above all the noise, above all the artillery and the explosion of bombs, if you please, God will hear your praying. Yeah. you got to release the error. Yeah. And so, Elisha got so upset because there were battles that they could have won if only Joash would have shot another arrow. There were victories that they could have enjoyed if only Joash had not been content to just shoot two or three arrows out the window. When I come when I come to the house of God, I've got to realize that this service is not just about this service. It's not just about, you know, well, it's Sunday night and I, I got to go to church and boy, I got other things that I need to be doing and boy, I've been so busy and I've got jobs backed up or, or you know, I, the, the, this is, the, the, the clothes are piled up in the laundry room and I need to be washing clothes and I need to be doing this and this and this. But do we realize that the arrow that I shoot in this service tonight, it's got a mark. There, there's a name on that arrow. Hey, man, there's a purpose in what I'm doing. And if I get slack and careless, if I come in with the same attitude that Joash had, is it, oh, well, it's just another Sunday night service. Oh, we'll go through the motions like we did last week. Oh, we got revival. Oh, yeah, I'm excited about revival. Who's going to be preaching it? Oh, man, I wish it was somebody else. Do we realize that the devil don't care who's preaching the revival? The devil doesn't care what time time of day or night. He, does, he doesn't care about your schedule. All he cares about is somehow or another that if he can find the, the chink in the armor, the weakest link in the chain, he's going to attack you right there. So you got to focus all of your energy, all of your effort in the place where you know you're most vulnerable. Amen. And shoot the arrow. When I come to church, 
Amen. As, as I said, it's important that I don't waste that time. Oh, the man of God. God was angry with the, with the king of Israel because he, he, he handled it in such a careless way. He just kind of walked in there uh, and he was more concerned and had more emotion about the fact that somebody was about to die than it was about the fate uh, of a country. Uh, hey, I'm telling you tonight uh, that more than anything else, uh, we need to come fully equipped with our quiver full of praise, of worship, amen, of prayer, and understand that we're killing giants every time we do it. Amen. I want y'all to do whatever you do best. Amen. We, are, we might ought to sing a little bit of that, Satan, your kingdom's coming down. Amen. I heard the voice from heaven say I'm not talking about me I'm talking about the word of God tells us that we can win these battles tonight amen we can put the devil under our feet oh yeah we a lot of us have done the brother Eddie Jones shuffle a lot of us have stomped the devil we've done all of that amen whatever it takes amen. I said whatever it takes whatever I've got to do to have victory not just for tonight but tomorrow and the next night and the next night and the weeks and months and years to come. I've got to be a quit. I've got to fight the good fight of faith every day. So some of you need to put a name on the arrow you're about to shoot. Some of you need to, I'm talking about that. Yeah, that name it and claim it. You need to name it and claim it tonight. When you start worshiping God, you need to tell God and you need to tell the devil, this is for that situation. And this is for that situation. And the next, uh, the next chorus, uh, the next song, uh, it's for that situation. Uh, this shout, uh, amen, this dance, uh, this leap, uh, this run uh, is for this and this and this. Amen, just go ahead and name it and claim it in Jesus' name tonight. I'm not going to let 
let you defeat me. I'm going to be an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of my testimony. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. That's it, Brother Grant. Go ahead. That's it, Brother Grant. Go ahead. Hey, this is for next week, next month. This is all about preparation for the battle. It's coming down. In Jesus' name. This is the era of the Lord's Satan, deliverance. Your kingdom's coming down. I heard the voice of heaven say, Satan, your kingdom's coming down. Go ahead, put the devil under your feet. Smite the ground. Smite the ground. Put an arrow. Let it hit its mark and drive your adversary into the ground. It's coming down. It's coming down. I don't know where. I don't know how. But it's coming down. In Jesus' name. I don't know where. I don't know how. But I know it will. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.
Yeah, hallelujah. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your help, God. Hallelujah. Thank you for the help of the Lord. God, we wouldn't do it without your help. God, just give us that boldness, that boldness to keep coming and to keep shooting, keep praying, keep pressing, keep reaching. Amen. God's listening. God's helping. Hallelujah. I've never heard it quite preached like that before, but I believe it. I receive it in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Brother Baker, for preaching to us. Keep shooting. Keep shooting arrows. Amen. We're going to be shooting arrows. Amen. Back here tomorrow night in prayer meeting, shooting arrows. Tuesday night, service, shooting arrows. Thank God for that good word. That's encouraging. Hallelujah. God is mindful of what we're doing. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. They can put the announcements up tonight. Certainly continue to pray for our pastor, Brother Mark, and the work that's going on in the Philippines. Praise God. Looking forward to Brother Parks Tuesday and Thursday and Brother Baker back with us 